Ed asked me to talk to you guys about an area that uh, I'm kind of nervous to talk to you about, to be honest with you, because I really feel that uh, if I don't cover this accurately for you, um, you probably, not that if I don't cover, but if, if this message at some time in your career doesn't get to you, you probably aren't going to make it. Um, it is not until you get this area of the business down. It's those who, I remember one time I listened to Jeff Levitan do a, a talk and it was called The Fast Start and this is a piece of The Fast Start. And, and he made a statement, he said, this is where the rubber meets the road. This is what separates the winners from the losers in this business. If you can get this part down, success is inevitable. If you don't, you'll go around playing with all the other parts of the system looking for that key, looking for that secret, and it's really just because you're scared to do this one part. Because this is where the, world, the real work in this company happens, is in what I'm about to talk about. Before I get into the mechanicals of it, um, you, there's some things that you've got to do before you ever decide to sit down and build a prospect list with someone, or you ever try to contact their people for them. And that is what Ed talked about a second ago. You have got to make sure that, that, that they have a very clear understanding of what their dreams are. See, the eight filters, right now you go through the eight filters and filter number seven is upstart school. And they took out a filter that, that uh, frankly, they're going to put back in. And that is, what's your dreams and goals? It used to be filter number five. Filter number eight used to be the, the do your financial strategy. Before you built your list, you had to come up with what your dreams and goals were. Last night we had a dreams and goals session with our um, inner circle in the field cabinet and the MDs. And uh, we got to go around a room and, and listen to why people were in this business and what they were doing it for. If people have a clear understanding like those guys did last night of why they're in this business, they will do anything you ask them to do, including building a prospect list and begin to contact them. If they're not clear on why they do this business and what we do for, and what we can possibly do for families, they will run from you when you try to get a prospect list from them and you try to help to get them to help contact it. I, uh, I didn't talk last night because I was going to talk for a second this morning, but uh, when, I, when I look at uh, why I do this business, you know, there's a lot of things that went around. A lot of people talked about a lot of different things. And uh, probably the predominant thought in my mind of what is, why am I in this business? It was because I wanted to protect my family. I wanted to, to, to be, Ed talks about this in the past, he, says, he wanted to be the go-to guy in his family. I, uh, last week, Ed called me up and he, he uh, was just asking me well, how it was going on. He, kind of tell, he could tell I was a little bit uh, distracted. And I had a situation in my family where, um, without going into details, there was, a, there was a situation in my family. And uh, because of who I've become in this company, because of the leader that has created, because of the financial position has put me into, when there was a situation in my family, who'd they go to? They went to me. I got a situation where I've got a family member that will probably be out of work for the next couple of months while they take care of some issues in their life. They've got house payments. They've got bills. I'm gonna, they knew that they could come to me and ask for help, that, that, that this business had put me in a position where they could come to me. They also knew that I knew how to handle a situation, that I had been developed through, the, through this business to become a leader where I could handle a situation for them. That when they needed to know, what do I need to do, they came to me. I was, in all their family, I was a guy that they could come to. I look at my children. Brian Arnold, is, I love what he talked about last night. He talked about um, how he had taken his daughter out to uh, a date and uh, showed her how a man should treat her and opened the door for her and took her to dinner and, and those type of things. And, and, uh, you know, and I do those things with my daughter. I have an 11-year-old daughter. And uh, I remember about a, a couple months ago at our church, they had this thing called the Purity Weekend. And it talks about how to prepare. You take your daughters to it and your sons to it at a young age so that they know how to go out and live their lives as they go through adolescence. And I was in there, and uh, it was interesting to me. We have a lo fairly large church, and there was a small group of people in there. There was two dads in there. I was one of them. I was one of them. Why? Because it was the middle of the day. The other dads were working. I was able to be there. I wanted to, I wanted to be the protector of my family. My son, I've told you this before, my son had, had a speech impediment and, and um, 
you know, we had wanted to, we wanted to take care of it, and, and uh, uh, because of this business, had I not been in this business, and I just had a job, I would have had to go into a system where you get on a year waiting list, and then you get 20 minutes a week for your kid to go through a speech uh, a therapy type of class. I was able to go out and hire the professor at the local university, who is one of the top speech specialists in the country. And he comes in personally a couple hours a week and, and teaches my, my son. And we took him out through the end of the year, and, and right before summer, he said, I think, you know, I think it's going to be okay. Let's take the summer off. And through the summer, he kind of slipped back a little bit. And, uh, you, know, and I was, uh, you know, so last week, I called him and said, hey, let's get it going again. That's, I mean, I, there's no way in the world, there's a mortgage payment to do that kind of stuff. No way in the world I would have been able to do that. If I had not been in this business, I couldn't have protected my son. I would have been, I, his future, his, his health would have been at the mercy of some system that the government could provide. I would not be in charge of taking care of my son. I didn't want anybody, I did not want to be in a situation where I could not control my family's well-being. I wanted to protect them. I wanted to protect them. Why are you in this business? Now I have some. I, 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 Jeff Levitan was talking about um, this charity that he started because he'd been through the business. And one of the things you find out is when you get the money, you know, you always hear how wealthy people aren't happy with their big houses, and and those are nice. But uh, matter of fact, I was talking to Tim Stonehawker, and uh, he was talking about he just when he moved to Atlanta, he bought a bigger house, and how he kind of wished that he had it. And he wants to downsize back to where he was, which the previous one was a pretty big house, also. You kind of, you know, I bought a Lexus about a year ago. I kind of wanted that. Okay, Ed says you got to have, you know, that's kind of cool to have a fast car, and and so I went and bought a Lexus. I had it for about a year, and it's kind of okay. That was nice, and I sold it. I, I mean, I, it's just not me. But 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 what are what are your reasons? You know, I, I like some of the stuff that Jeff talked about. You know, and we all have our own dreams. You know, Jeff's out there starting his own uh, charity. He's going to Nicaragua, is that it? Next October, I, you know, I, I plan on talking to him. I'd like to go do that kind of stuff with him. Uh, you know, I, I want to be one of the number one contributors to his charity, to his foundation. You know, I, I wanted to make sure, I've told, uh, in the past, I've told people that, uh, yeah, I kind of use the analogy that, that uh, one of the things that when people just ask me, what is success to you? And I, the, the parable of the talents in the Bible where it talks about, um, you know, uh, the master had given three servants talents and, and uh, the first two went and uh, doubled them and they came to him and said, well, good, well done, good and faithful servant. And the last one um, didn't do anything with what he was given and went to the master and the master said, you know, get away from me, you evil servant. You know, that's kind of paraphrasing it if you can't tell. But uh, they, uh, you know, I, when, I, when I go before my maker, I want him to say, well done, good and faithful servant. That's success to me. I love that I'm in a business where I have a chance to go out and prove I'm given an opportunity to go and succeed at the level that I'm capable of, that I, that I can go and prove what I'm made of, and that I can do all those other things that I talked about. Why are you in this business? You better make sure when you get a new recruit, you better cover that stuff with them. And you better be very clear on why you're in the business so they can even begin to understand how to dream. Because they, they forgot how to dream. They got into some job. They're just living paycheck to paycheck. They're just trying to pay their bills. They don't know how to dream anymore. And so you better be clear on your dreams so that you can tell them your dreams so they can begin to think about what, are, what their dreams are. Then you start talking about a list. You start talking about a list before they are clear on why they're doing this business. Give it up. They might give you one. You ever wonder why you sit down and fast start someone and then you never see them again? Right? Anyone had that happen to you? It's because they they're not interested in what you, you've done to them. You, you've talked about some, you know, as I said, you talked about selling mortgages or something. They weren't sold a dream. Here's the second thing that fuels, it, fuels your business, is they've got to be crusaders. They better, they better be clear in what we can do for families. They, they better get into this company and better love what we do for people. I remember Kevin a couple of weeks ago was talking to me about one of his clients and, and uh, he was sitting down with this client and the client was, uh, he sat down and he was showing him a couple of different products. One was, was you know, the guy was going to invest a few hundred, uh, like three or four hundred dollars a month and, and uh, you know, by the time he got to, to retirement age, he was going to like have a million and a half dollars tax free. Before doing that, he wouldn't have been anywhere close to that. But he also sat down and showed him another product was, he sat down and showed him how, how he could be debt free in 9.2 years and the guy was looking at that and, and he didn't seem too excited. He was kind of like, okay, 9.2 years, I'll be out of debt. And Kevin said, that includes your house. 
She's like, what, my house too? What? He couldn't believe it. Do you understand? Think about this. You sit down with someone, and, and they're not saving money. If they are saving, they're not saving in the right places. They're not going to retire. They're not going to retire the way they're doing it. They're going to be in debt for the next 30, 40, 50 years, making house payments and car payments and credit card payments. That's how people live their lives. You can literally go into someone's home and sit down and have them totally debt-free and financially independent in 15 years or less with what we can do for people. I mean, think about your life. If you woke up tomorrow morning, you had no house payment, no car payments, no credit card payments, you owe no one anything. How would your life be different? Think about, I mean, think about the stresses you have as you sit here. Some of you are sitting here thinking about that bill, that mortgage payment you got to, that you're late on right now. Right? And you're worried about it's coming up 30 days late pretty soon. Right? This is what stresses people out. It's why people get divorced in this country. People don't lay up at night worrying about what kind of soap they're going to use. They don't worry about what kind of phone service they're going to use. They, work at, they lay up at night worrying about how they're going to send their kids to college. How are they going to retire? How are they going to pay their bills? How are they going to get out of debt? Those are the problems that we they better understand that before you sit down and try to get a list out of them. You better have a crusader when you sit down with someone sitting in front of you, and you better have a dreamer before you sit down with someone. Those two things must come first before you ever try to build a prospect list. Then you can start doing the stuff that we'll go through now. Now let's get practical. Let's go over some practical stuff. Now this is the boring stuff, but we got to cover it. Can we get the ammo on? First of all, first of all, I just tell you the two, first two reasons why people don't want to build a list. You haven't turned them into crusaders yet, and you haven't turned them into dreamers yet. But why else do they not want to build a list with you? Trust, here, here's what it is. They're afraid you're going to embarrass them. They're afraid you're going to go talk to their friends and try to recruit them and sell them. And they're not, and they don't quite understand what business they're in yet. They're, they, they haven't had to explain to them. And so you've got to give them the psychology of behind why we're building the list and why we're going to contact them. So when you sit down with them, there's two analogies that you've got to master. By the way, one of the things as I go through this stuff, and you're writing notes today, you have got to become a student of this business. You can't just like sit in here today, listen to this stuff, and then go back and let that be the end of it. You've got to take some time, and you've got to master this stuff. You, you've got to go home and do some homework. Rich Sully always used the analogy. How many of you guys have ever had, a, like, a geometry class or a, uh, right, some, a hard class in high school or college? How many of you ever had an, one exam that you actually had to study for? And you spent hours upon hours, right? You remember those days? You spent all those times studying for it. Tons of effort. And you went in and you passed the class. What, what, was it, what did you get? What was the result of you spending all those hours studying for that exam? You got a grade, right? You got a letter, A, B, C. Did it change your life today? Does it pain your mortgage today? You got a letter. Do you know if you'd spend the same amount of time studying this business and mastering it as it would take to spend the same time that it would take you to master one exam? that will pay you hundreds or th hundreds of thousands of millions of dollars if you would take the same amount of time and effort that it took you to study for one exam. That's what you got to do with this stuff. So you got to learn two analogies. You got to memorize them. You got to master them. You, they got to be conversational. They got to flow out of you. You can't read it. You can't sound mechanical when you're doing it. You've got to master these. Here's the rest of the analogy. When you're sitting down with someone, say, listen, Joe, we're going to get you started in this business. And you're starting a business just like any other business. Uh, kind of like if you're starting a restaurant. So if you were to start a restaurant, one of the things that you would probably do before you had your grant, before you opened the doors, you'd have a kind of a pre-grant opening. You'd, you'd invite your friends down and your associates and your coworkers and your family. Everyone you know, you'd want, to come, want them to come in. You'd want them to taste the food and check out the ambiance and give you their opinion and, and all those things. But what would you really be hoping for? I mean, you want their opinion, but it doesn't really matter because you probably, you're probably into this thing a quarter million, half a million dollars, so their opinion, opinion is pretty irrelevant at that point, right? What are you really hoping for when you invite them down to your, to your new business, to your restaurant? That they like it. That they like it. That they will become a source of future referrals for you. 
That's your only reason why you really want them to come down. You're hoping that they like it so that next week when they're sitting around the water cooler at, at, at work and they're talking about where to go to lunch, they're going to say, hey, you know what? My buddy Rob just opened up a restaurant and I was there last week. It was pretty good. And they begin to send people over to them. They begin to be a source of referrals. They might even like it enough to, that they become a, a consumer of your restaurant. But, but the most important thing is that they will tell other people about it. The last thing you would do if you opened up a business or a restaurant would be to keep it a secret and not tell anyone. You would tell everybody in the world about it. Well, it's the same thing here. You have opened up a financial services restaurant, and you've got to get the word out. We've got to let everybody know that you've started into a new, that you've got, you started a new career. You've opened up a new business, that you're in a new industry. I had a friend in my business uh, that I recruited about a year ago. And he came to me and he, he said, uh, he'd been in about six months at this point. He came to me and said, hey, Rob, my mom just uh, uh, refinanced her house and, and invested some money. I said, that's assuming that he, right, he, she had done it with him. I said, that's great. He goes, no, it's not. She didn't do it with me. She did it with someone else. And I said, you know, why? Because sometimes, you know, sometimes relatives are funny about that and, and they want to do it with someone else. And that would have been a mistake because obviously he didn't get him in front of the field trainer like he should have. But I said, well, why? What happened? He goes, well, I never told her I was in the business. Six months in the business. His mom didn't know he was in the business. Refinances her house to someone else, invests with someone else. Now, that's just the beginning of it. That cost him, right? His mom tells him about it. He goes, well, mom, I could have, he, he continues the story, mom, I could have done that for you. She goes, well, I didn't even know you were doing this. Well, what do you do? And he sat down and started showing her some of our concepts for the first time after it was too late. All of a sudden, she moved from being kind of like feeling bad because she hadn't done business with her son to being irritated with her son because it cost her literally tens of thousands of dollars because of the plan that she got into versus what he could have done for her. It wasn't, it wasn't, I mean, it cost him, but it cost the people he knew more than it cost him. They're the ones that, 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 that got ripped off, not him. You got to make sure that everybody, so you better have a story like that. You better have a story like that. <clears throat> By the way, that's part of, I, that wasn't a story I was just telling you. I do every single, every time I'm doing a list. That's the reason why we got to get the word out to every person you know. You got to have a story like that. And you get the word out to everybody you know. Now what are we going to try to do when we go out there? Baseball analogy. Analogy number two, when you go out and see your people, it's kind of like a baseball game. When you're playing baseball, you don't have to have everyone on the team hit a home run in order to win a baseball game. What do you got to do? You get one or two home runs, maybe a triple or two, maybe a double or two, but you get a bunch of singles, and it starts adding up to runs, and you're going to win this game. So what's, what's a single in this business? You, you go out and we prospect, we contact one of these people, someone that you know, and we get them to take a look at, the, at this company, this financial restaurant that you've started. And we go see them, and they say, you know what? That looks good. I, I think you could do this. I, I think that's a good company. I, now, I don't need it. I got my own financial life already in order, and I love what I do. I'm not really looking for an opportunity, but, but I think that's a good company. I, I think, you know, if I were to run into someone in the future that I thought could use your services, I, I'd refer them over to you. That's a single. That's what you're looking for. You're looking for two things when you go out and see someone's world market. One is to turn them from, the, from potentially being the most negative influence in their life, which is their friends and family, the people they know. And if you don't get the story in front of them properly, they will be the most negative. They will be the ones that pull your recruits out of this business from you. And two, you want them to be excited about the company so they will become a source of referrals. I've got people that, that, that in the beginning of my business, they didn't do business with me. But throughout the years, they've sent people to me. They, they refer people over to me just because I got the word, because they know I'm in the business. Just because they know I'm in the business. A double would be the same scenario. You go out, you talk to them, they like what they see, they, uh, they're excited about it, and uh, but still not for them, but they have an immediate referral. They say, you know what, I, I don't need that, but my, 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 my brother Joe, he could, he could use that, you know, that, that, that little mortgage thing you're talking about, or he, he needs to do some investing, he, you know, and they give you a referral right then and there, or he's not happy with what he's doing, he, he's looking for a new opportunity, and they actually give you a referral right there. That's a double. A triple is same scenario, but they do need some help. 
You know, how do you say you can get out of debt in 10 years instead of 30 years? How do you do that? Right? That tax now, tax later, tax never. I, I got tax later. How does that tax never thing work? And they begin going down the path of becoming a client with you. That'd be a triple. Home run? They see this thing, they say, you know what? I know everybody needs to hear this kind of stuff. Because as you're doing your presentation, you're asking, how many people do you know need to hear this kind of stuff? They say, man, this person does, and this person does. And they say, how can I get in business with you? And home run is they decide to get in business with you. Success, as we go out and start talking to your people, is that just we, all we're looking for is singles. We got, here's our two objectives. We want to make you look good, and we want to make our company look good. So the people you know will be, a, will be referral over to you, will refer people over to you, just like in that restaurant analogy. That's what we're trying to do. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to play a little game. And you pull out a blank piece of paper, not a top 25 list, a blank piece of paper, and you slide it over to them across the table. Now, you could do this this fast start could be this part of the, it could be done in a hiring interview sometimes. It might be done in a special fast start session. You and your marketing directors figure that out. Everyone does a little bit differently. Sometimes it depends on time. But you got to do this every single time. You slide a blank piece of paper over to them. You say, hey, here's what we're going to do. We're going to take the next five minutes and I want you to write down every name that pops into your head. And I'm going to throw out some memory joggers as we're doing it. And I want you to write down every name that pops into your head. Now, these may be people that you call. We may never contact them. What it is, this is an exercise of getting names out of your head and onto paper. From there, we'll decide whether or not there's someone you want to invite to your grand opening. We just got to get the names out of your names out of your head onto paper. That's the goal of this. Now, the record is 83 in five minutes. Now, I don't know if you can beat that, but let's see what you can. Right, you throw that out to see if you got a competitor in front of you, and you'll find out of three or four, they will kill themselves to beat that record. To beat that record. Now be careful, a lot of times they just write down fake names, so you want to qualify those names when you get done. You get some people that are real competitive. And you say, ready, go. And you take five minutes and you throw a memory. Now you've got to have five, six memory joggers memorized that you can throw out to them. Right? Let's start with family members. You know, who do you, who, who's in your family? Mom, dad, brother, sister, aunts, uncles, cousins. And you start throwing out, right, because they're not thinking about, you know, in-laws. And, 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 you, and you, you keep going on that subject until they, you see them slowing down. When they slow down, you switch. How about friends? Who, who do you hang out with? Who are friends from high school? Right? And you go through that. How about coworkers? Who do you work with? Who's your boss? And they start writing down names. Who do you work with at your last job? And they and right, you go through it. How about social? How about church? Who do you go to church with? And they start writing down names. And they start going. They start slowing down. You throw out another one. Who's your neighbor across the street? Who's the neighbor next door? Who's the neighbor right catty corner to you? Who lives behind you? And you got five or six memory joggers that if you just did those, that it would take them way more than five minutes to come up with all the people they know. On average, you'll get 40 to 50 names in that five minute of time. That's what it really comes out to. That's what you really end up with. You'll get 40 to 50 names during that session. Now you give them the rules of the list. The rules of the list. You got some of them here. Rule number one is you always add names. First of all, rule number one is actually your list needs, your, this is called your master list. It's on this blank piece of paper. What you need to do is you need to take it and you need to, uh, Mike, let me just borrow this for a second. Sure. You need to get a, 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 a sorry about that. You need to get a, a binder like this where, 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 I'm dropping everything from you. You get a binder where, where you can keep it. You, got, you can't just use this blank piece of paper I, get, I gave you. You got to take it and you got to put your names on this list here. Hey. And you got to have one so you can show it to them. This list should grow to be, be, become, be between 100 and 500 names. It's going to start with what, like we started, the people you know. It's going to grow because we're going to go out and see people and they're going to give you referrals. And you're going to add those to your list. And then you're going to, we're going to teach you how to, do, uh, how to network with people, how to go out and start talking to people, pick up business cards. And you're going to, when you do that, it goes on your list. And your list will, should grow to be between 100 and 500 names, minimum. That's where it's got to end up at. Rule number two is you always add names. You never eliminate them. Always add names, never eliminate them. You may put some on your list that today isn't worth calling. When I started off, I had friends that were 18, 19 years old. They were in college. Didn't make sense to them. Ten years later, they're in their late 20s. They've got kids, families, good jobs. Or look, they've been around long enough in a job that they know that's not where they want to be. I, I've got people that I'm in the, in, the, in the middle of recruiting right now because timing is right. I've had them on my list for 10 years. Always add names. Never eliminate them. Rule number three 
Because you've got to keep your list with you at all times. Keep it with you at all times. How many of you guys got your list in here? Raise your hand. Problem, right? There's a problem. You've got to keep your list with you at all times. Why? You're going to be driving down the road, and a name's going to pop into your head. And guess what? It's going to pop out of your head just as fast. You better have your master list where you, when that name pops in, you can write it down. You're going to be sitting in a class, and they're going to be talking about something, and names are going to pop into your head. As soon as that class is over, it's going to pop out of your head. You've got to have your list with you at all times, so you're always adding to them. You're going to pick up, you're going to pick up business cards. You'll lose them if you don't add them to your list immediately. You've got to keep your name, list with you at all times. One of the biggest challenges in your business is going to be inspired just to make phone calls. That's the hardest thing we do. There's going to be meetings that you're at, times that you're inspired, and you feel like, man, I want to make calls. You don't got your list with you, you can't even do it. You've got to have your list with you at all times. Keep it with you at all times. Everybody in your business has to have their list with them at all times. Now, here's what we're going to do with this master list. We're going to take it, and we're going to distill it down to your top 25. Every month, we're going to take your master list, and we're going to distill it down to your top 25. These are the people that we are going to contact. We're going to take this master list and we're going to qualify them. We're going to find out who's the best ones on them that we want to contact and get in front of immediately, that we want to have your grand opening with to start with. Now, here's what we're looking for. Here's who needs to go at the top of these lists. The first one is, if you're broken down at the side of the road at 3 o'clock in the morning, and while you got the master list in front of them, I want you to put a little X next down next that would pick you up. If you're broken down at the side of the road at 4 o'clock in the morning, put a little check mark next to any one of this master list that would come pick you up. Those are the first person people we're putting on this list. And after they do that, you take their top, you know, one or two, three, and you fill it in for them. And you go through this list so they understand it. And you fill a name, and you have them spell, fill in the spouse's name. Explain what F slash A is. Friend, you know, F is friend. A is an, is an acquaintance. What are they? Their home number, office number. Uh, then you profile them. All right, profiles at the, the, the profile at the bottom. One is a 30 years or older. If they're married, you put a two in there. If they uh, have dependent children, you put a three. Homeowner, four. Solid business or career background, five. Uh, 40,000 plus household income, they got a six. Seven is the dissatisfied. And so you, what are they? Are they a one, three, four, six? Are they one, two, three, four, five, six, seven? What, what are they? How many pointers are they? And you profile them. And the rest is follow-up. What's the date they contacted? And you just you walk them through that. And you begin to take their list, and you build their top 25 list for them. Here's the, now, here's the mistake most people make. Almost everything I did, they won't do, because it's the work. Here's what we do. We recruit someone, and we hope they start inviting people to meetings. And that's, how, that's our building system. Recruit them, hope they get excited, and hope they start bringing some people to the next meeting. That's what we hope. That's how I believe 99% of the people in this business run their business. They do not take them through. They do not physically fill out the list with them. They don't find out who their fish in a barrel are. That's those people that would pick, pick them up at 3 o'clock in the morning, by the way. They don't find out any of those things. They just hope they're going to do it. They send them home with this thing called a top 25 list. Matter of fact, they let the orientation class even tell them about the top 25 list. Send them home like it's homework. Right? How many of us like doing homework when we were in school? We didn't do it. They do not take control. This is what we call controlling the point of contact. This, this is what it's all about. You've got to take control of this business, and you've got to do it with them. I'm telling you guys, there's nothing more important I could be telling you than right now. If you will physically do this part of the business with your new recruit, how many of you someone did this with? Less than 5% of the room. Most of you did not have this done for you. Most of you didn't have it done for you. And so what you did was what we call the scenario disaster. And so you take that list, let me put that back up there. You take that list and you build it out. Now you gotta contact it. How are you gonna contact this list? I'm gonna share with you kind of where I've, uh, through 10 years, what I've seen, there, there's a lot of, I need to be careful on this, there's a lot of great ideas out there. There's a lot of unbelievable scripts. One of the reasons I joined Ed when I met him in 96 was he had unbelievable ideas. 
unbelievable scripts, ways of contacting people, all kinds of things out there. What I had to do is I had to, uh, I had to, I had to distill down to a couple that I knew worked almost 100% of the time and then wash everything out. Even though there's a bunch of other good stuff out there, so you pick your two or three, and you know, your, whatever your MD and your leader says you do, that's what you do. This is what I do. This is what we've distilled it down to. And we've tested these. Um, we've tested these scripts. Ed uh, actually put some voicemails out a few months ago on them. Basically, they're help me scripts are the ones that I use. First thing you do, though, before you go into your scripts is, no, well, that's not it. There we go. Is you make sure they understand scenario of disaster. Because more important than understanding what to say initially is what not to say. And so you explain to them that we have this thing called scenario of disaster. And by the way, this has got to happen in the hiring interview. Matter of fact, this has got to happen the first chance you get to tell them. Because they will go do this almost immediately. A lot of times, you don't even have a chance to explain this to them before they've already done it. A lot of times they've done this before they even show, showed up to the first BPM, just trying to tell someone what they were invited to. They've done this. Here's what scenario disaster is. You get excited, you're gonna go out and you start, you're gonna start talking to people. They're gonna start asking you questions. You're gonna try to answer them because that's what you feel obligated to do when someone asks you a question. You're gonna answer them halfway or wrong because you can't take a BPM, learn, learn it, and, and then turn around and repeat it you know, word for word and understand everything you've heard. All, you, all a new person has when they come out of a BPM is a good feeling. A good, they kind of feel good about what they saw. They don't understand what we do yet. They just kind of feel good about it. They cannot turn around and articulate it. So they answered halfway, they answer it wrong, which causes people to jump to conclusions like, oh, okay, you sell insurance, or you're a mortgage guy, or you're in multi-level marketing. Those are the three things people assume that you do the way that you explain it because you didn't know how to explain it properly. And they jump to those conclusions, guess what? You're done. You're all, your chances of getting in front of that person are slim to none. Or your new recruit's chances of getting back in front of those people are slim to none. And so you've got to make sure they understand scenario disaster. Say so there's, there, there, there are, are, there's a certain way that we've got to contact you, the, people, the people that you know. And you've got to explain our system to them. They gotta understand the magic of our system. It takes two things in order to have a successful transaction, whether it's a sale or a recruit. It takes two things, trust and respect. Trust and respect. If I contact your brother who doesn't know me, it's a cold call. I call him up, what's the odds of him letting me come over to his home? Slim to none, right? Not going to happen. He doesn't know me. There's no trust. But you call your brother up. What's the odds of him letting us over to his house? If, if you don't do scenario disaster to him, 100%. Almost 100%, unless, he just, unless you have no, he just doesn't like you, right? Almost 100%, because he trusts you. Now, if you go over to your house, your brother's house, and he knows that you're a police officer, and now you're going to sit down and try to do his financial planning, or you're going to try to right, get him into the business world, is he going to listen to you? No, why? You're missing the other, the other half. Respect. He doesn't respect you. Right? If he ever wants to be arrested, he knows you're the guy to go to. Wants financial planning? It's not you. He doesn't respect you. But if he brings me in with his trust, and then he edifies me as an expert, as a, right, financial guru, he, he does the proper edification. Now all of a sudden, I've got the respect. I, I, I've got the respect. He, he doesn't know anything about me. I could be in the business one day longer than you, but because of how, how you present me and edify me and introduce me, he th he's going to give me the benefit of the doubt that I know what I'm talking about. Because he doesn't know me. He doesn't know me. That's the magic of our system. That's why the war market system works. So here's what we do. You got this map, you got your top 25 list. What's your number one goal when you got a new recruit? What's the first thing they got to do with their market? Get their top three people to the very next meeting. Top three people to the very next meeting. ASAP's important, got to get out and do field training. All that's got to be done. But if you want to set the stage for your team to be a building and recruiting team, top three people have got to be fed into the next BPM. And who are those people going to be? The fish in the barrel. 
the guys that they could pick up at 3 o'clock in the morning. They, you've got to have a script. Now, here's, here's a script that we use for that. Now, it could be, this is just something that was sewn together. Um, you, you could change it around. The premise of it is help me. That's just the premise of it. We got this up there? Is it on delay or is it, do I turn it off or is it coming? The Help Me script, this is a script uh, designed to get people in, to, to get the top three people to the meeting. Here's a reason why I think um, the Help Me script is, is probably the best, in my opinion, the best way of approaching someone's warm market. Think about uh, the people that you know your friends, your family, if they came to you and uh, all of a sudden they had this unbelievable business or this unbelievable product, we almost discount it because it's them. Just because of who they are, we almost discount it. We're in a natural competition with the people that we know, with our warm market. We, we don't want them to be our heroes, we want to be their heroes. So when they come and, man, I'm going to change your life, I got this funny, however you might have probably got this unbelievable business, there's a little bit of them not wanting to do it just because you told them about it. Just because it was your idea, right? You ever have those people, just because it was your idea, you almost got to like give the idea to someone else and let them tell them so that they'll accept it. You ever know people like that? That's most of us, by the way. And so, but everybody loves to give their opinion. Everybody loves to feel needed and wanted and, and that you need their help. And all of a sudden, you put them in a position of being the hero for you. And so the basic, the basic without, I'm not even going to read this script exactly. There's two scripts. One is the help me script to get them to a meeting. One is the help me script to get them on a point. But here's, here's kind of the concept of it. You started, a, you made a new career change. You're, 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 you're starting a new career, a new business. And you need their help, and there's a couple things, a couple reasons why you need their help. I'm gonna take this off so you don't try to read it either. There's a couple reasons why you need their help. One is you want their opinion of it. Two, you're going, you're, you're in a training program. You're going through some licensing. You're going to, uh, uh, you're doing some classroom training. But the company has asked that that uh, that you have three or four or five people come down and take a look at it and give their opinion. They want to make sure that I'm comfortable with what I'm about to, with the company that I'm about to get involved in. They want to get, they want me to get some feedback from people that I trust and know very well. Would you mind helping me out? Great, and you invite them straight down to the meeting. Get them down there uh, to your BPM. The top three people is that help me script. Then you get the help me script for their for their ASAP program. Same script. Hey Joe, this is Rob. I don't know if you've heard. I've gotten into. Uh, I'm in the process of making a career change. I'm getting into the financial services industry. I was wondering if you'd do me a favor. I'm in their training program. I've got some classroom training I'm doing. I've got to get some licenses. But i have being. I've got to go out and I've got to. Uh, do on-the-job training. I, I've got to see our company in action uh, with 10 people that I know and trust. And what I'm, what I, what I'm going to ask you to do is, is to set up a time with me where we can sit down for a few minutes, sh for about 45 minutes, show you what I'm doing. I want you to ask lots of questions because that's how I'm going to get the best training. And uh, 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 <laughs> I'm going to get lots of I'm going to get lots of training. Have you asked lots of questions? And that's what help help me out in my training process. Would you mind helping me out? What's the odds of your of your top five, ten people, your friends, your family saying no to you? Right? You started a new career. It's not Amway, right? It's not some goofy cell. It's not Kirby vacuum cleaners. You've started a new career in the financial services industry. And here's the great news about it: when they ask you, well, what is it? Well, what's a company? We don't have to hide behind anything. Yeah, the company's fine. World Financial Group, they're a subsidiary of Aegon. You can go ahead and tell them that. They're a $240 billion company. They own a company called Transamerica. You heard of Transamerica, right? Yeah. You, right? Every other, do you understand every other company that gave you this script would tell you to hide who you work for and not tell them anything about it? The, the more, as long as you don't go too far, the more information you give them about us, the more credible it sounds and the more they want to hear it. What? That company hired you? I know you, right? <laughs> a two, a company like Aegon and Transamerica, they wouldn't hire someone. What are you doing? They, now they're curious, right? They want to know what the heck you're doing. And so you give them the information. Now you don't. Now it's only if they ask what it is. Here's the reality of it. 
most of the people that you, that you when you call that way, most of the people, because it's your brother, it's your best friend, it's your dad, right? It's, it, it, they're going to do it for you just because you ask them to do your favor. Here's the deal. It works. Uh, the help me approach works almost 100% of the time unless you got a guy that just has no credibility in his market. The, his friends don't like him. And he just thinks they're friends and they're not friends. That is it. I'm telling you, we had, we literally, I had a, uh, we had a BPM, we had low attendance. And I did what you do on a BPM night if you have low attendance. I don't let them think that they're there for training. I st we stopped the classes, we canceled all classes, and we went right into we're not contacting people, we're not inviting. And we did a class on, on, on inviting and those type of things. And at the end of the class, Kevin did it. He pulled up three brand new people after he did training on this. He said, he grabbed three brand new people. And in a room, there was 75 people in there. And he said, okay, call. Now we had role played it. Part of the training was we role played this thing five, 10 times. To the, we got them in a role playing situation past the, the, the awkward stage and the natural stage. And we got them to the point where they could say it and sound, sound somewhat like they knew what they were saying. And we got them in front of the entire room. And, and now I was kind of nervous when he did this. I'm never going to call ever again. You just blew out 75 of my teammates here at my base shop. He has them pick up the phone 100%. And, not, and they didn't, because they were one of 75 people, they were nervous. And so they did kind of fumble through it. But it just works. People want to help you out. They call them up, all three of them, set appointments, or were invited down to the meetings. And I, I, mean, I mean, it blew me away. But you got, now here's the deal. As it can work 100% of the time. You don't control the point of contact. You don't sit down with them. See, when you do that top 25 list and say, we've got to get your top three people to the next meeting, guess what? You've got to hand them the script and you've got to role play it. And you've got to do it until they sound natural at it. Here's what usually happens. You do it one or two times, you're tired of it. It's monotonous. The most important part of this business is monotonous. It's the work. We don't want to do it. We don't, it doesn't feel good. But it's the most important part. If you, do you understand if you just sit down and do someone's top 25 list, give them a script that works almost 100% of the time, role play it, and then make them make the calls while you're sitting right there with them. Don't send them home to do it. They won't do it. Just accept the reality of it. They won't do it. You know why I know that? You know why you should know that? Because you won't do it. You don't do it. Think about this. Who's probably the most committed person, the most excited person on your team about this business and wants to make it happen more than anybody on your team? You are. And you still won't do it. So do you think this guy that's less committed than you is going to go home and do it? And you're wondering why you're not growing. I guarantee you the reason you're not growing is you don't sit down, you don't build lists, you don't role play with them, and you don't make them make calls with you. I don't care if you do it in a phone blitz session or one-on-one, -on -one, but it's got to be done with, a, with you, with a field trainer, which is probably you in your business, and you have got to do it. And, we'll, and now here's what you'll do. You'll, you'll, you're going to do this. You'll get 100% success. It's unbelievable. And then you'll stop doing it again. You'll, you will, you'll have success doing it, and then you'll stop again. For the rest of your life, if you're not growing, it's because you're not doing this. And when you are growing, because you can't set appointments, you can't get people coming down to the meetings and not have good things happen. Our story's too good. Our company's too good. What we do for families is too good. Their dreams are too big. And when they start seeing this company, they, understand, they start realizing their dreams can happen. Good things start happening when you get them in front of our company. If you're not growing, it's because you're not getting people in front of our company. And the reason you're not getting people in front of our company is because you're not doing this. And if you're not doing this, you honestly think you're going to go out and meet strangers and get them into the business? If you can't even get people's best friends and relatives, if you can't run a system where you have almost 100% success rate when you do it, do you think you're going to go out and like Friendship Farm and, right, I'm going to talk about that tomorrow, but you're not going to do any of that stuff if you can't even figure out how to work a system where you have almost 100% success rate. I'm telling you guys, if you'll do this one little area, you got enough leaders in here that can do everything else for you. If you could master this one little area, in the next 12 to 18 months, you'll be a CEO or bigger if you master this one little area. Thanks. How are you guys doing this morning? Dan? 
Is that where all your hair went to your back? Did you ever saw that? <laughs> I love Dan Charlier. I, uh, yesterday we talked about uh, putting a list together and uh, how you extract a list from people's warm markets. The problem with that is that if you stop there, think about it, it took you 25, 35, 40, 50, 60 years to put that list together. That's a list of the people that you know. And so what do you do once you've contacted those people? How do, you, how do you add to that list on a continuous basis? Um, about five, year, five, six years ago, I got my hands on a tape of uh, Hubert Humphrey. And there's a lot of different ideas of how to do this, but uh, I tend to want to uh, uh, stick with the guys that did it the biggest. And uh, I got up my hands on the tape of Hubert Humphrey back in 19, I think he was doing a training in 1981. Ed, he was doing it, he was training. He was teaching people the words to say. It's amazing. And uh, he was doing this training class. And now, if you don't know Hubert's background, he, uh, he got started in uh, Macon, Georgia. And then shortly afterwards, he wanted to uh, uh, kind of do something a little bit different with the company. And Art wasn't quite sure if it would work out. He had kind of this unique recruiting thing that he wanted to do. And so he sent him over to uh, Denver, Colorado to make sure he was away from the team enough so that if it didn't work out, it wouldn't distract the rest of what they were doing. So he went there and he had one referral. One referral. Here was the results of, of what he did. Six months later, he had hired 1,200 people onto his team. 12 months later, he had 3,400 people on his team. 18 months later, he had over 15,000 people on his team. How in the world do you do that? Let me ask you, if you had one, per, one referral, not even one person that you knew, just one referral, do you have the confidence that you'd be able to do that? Here's how he did it. He did something called, he mastered something called friendship farming, which is simply a way of, uh, you switching that over? Is that better? He mastered a concept called friendship farming. And all friendship farming is doing something that you've done all your life. Some of you are better at it. Some of you need to get better at it. And it's where you basically get into conversations and you do small talk with people. You know, all your life when you've gone out and you get in line and you're, and you're there, you, you've started conversations and you've talked to them. You go to a park, you've started conversations and you talk to them. You go to the bank and it's a long line. You've, you've gotten yourself into conversations and it's just, it's what some people do. Some people are, are unbelievable about it. My wife, you know, she, she talks to everybody all the time. Whether you want to talk to her or not, you're going to talk to her. That's her personality. And so some people do it. Some people like me, I had to learn how to do this stuff. I, I'm not the type, I'm, not, I'm a very introverted person by nature. I, I don't go out and talk. I, I, I've learned to do it, but I hate Mozone. I hate Mozone. I hate going out there and talking to people. It's not my, it's not my natural demeanor. I, I had to learn to do that part of this business. If you ever want to get big in this company, and get, you have got to get to the point where you can turn strangers into friends. We call it the three foot rule. If you're within three feet of someone, you need to be talking to them. But what you've got to do is you've got to know what to do and what not to do. Because I found out that people try to go out and do this and they don't do it on a consistent basis. It's because they're doing all kinds of crazy stuff that doesn't work. And so I'm going to go through with you what, what Hubert talked about on this tape and how he did it. What his process was. You, you got to know not only what to say, you got to know when to say it and when not to say it. You got to know what your objective is. Let me ask you a question. And I want some of you to throw out an answer on this. If I were to ask you, what do you do, what would your answer be? Throw, throw out a few at it. What do you say? Someone asks you, what do you do? What was that? Professional problem sol solver. What else? Teach families how to make and save money and get out of debt. What else? Building a marketing company. I'm in the people business. In your mind, first, here's the first thing. If you couldn't, when I ask that question, spit out an answer just like that, I know you're not doing this. There's no way in the world you're doing this if you can't, if you, if it's got to be at the top of your head, right? Yesterday someone, I don't know who it, who it was, but someone said that you've got to spend your first 24 hours in this business 
learning what you got to say and then spend the rest of your career saying it. How long have you been in this, in this deal and you don't even know what to say when someone asks you what you do? Think about it. If you're sitting in that chair trying to figure out what do you say if someone asks you what you do, that, that's, forget everything else that was said this weekend. Go figure that out over the next couple days. Now, here's the deal. If, if uh, when I asked you that question, you said something that related to product, you're a product-minded person. If you said something related to recruiting or building a team, then you got a building mindset. What's your mindset, how you answer that question will tell you what your real mindset is. Are you thinking about making some sales and making some money, or are you thinking about building a company? That's the first thing I want you to think about. I'm going to go through the scripts that, that I learned from that tape, and I kind of integrated it with some stuff that I learned from Ed and, and what we put together. First of all, let's talk about friendship farming and what you do. We do what some call form. F stands for family, O stands for occupation, R stands for recreation, M stands for message. It's basically what, you, what I said already. You've done that all your life. You go out and these are the things that you do small talk about. You get in the conversation. You talk about their family. You talk about hobbies. You talk about uh, 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 occupation and those type of things. Here's the bottom line. At some point during the conversation, you've got to get to the point where they ask you what you do. Usually the best way of doing it is at some point you ask them what they do and their natural response is eventually ask you what you do. That's how you get to the point. Now here's, here's what you've got to know. When they, as soon as they ask you what, you're, what you do, you're on. You're now, right? You're now on the job. You got to know exactly what to say. First of all, what's the objective when you're out there talking to someone? You're standing in line at the bank, or you're at the park, and you're doing those type of things. What's your objective? Let me tell you what your objective is not to do. Your objective is not to invite them to the BPM. Your objective is not to set an appointment. Your objective is not to try to sell them or recruit them anything. Your objective is to build rapport and get a contact. That's it. You go any farther than that, walls will come up and your odds of success greatly diminish. If you do this right, you have almost 100% success. If you do it wrong, you fail almost 100% of the time. The reason why you don't do this more often is because we do, we've done it wrong. We've, we've done this narrow disaster in the friendship farming area, and so we got scared and we stopped doing it. I'm telling you, if you do it right, you almost never fail. And so what do you say when they ask you what you do? What I say is real simple. It's one line. I believe that simplific simplification thing. And by the way, this is, only the, this is the third script I talked about. I have two scripts. Help me script to get the top three people to the meeting. Help me script to set their, ace, their, their appointments to get out in the field. And then a script that, that they can use in almost any scenario here. The script that I use when they ask me what we do is, I work for a financial services company. I help them open up offices. As soon as I make that statement, I get off of the subject and I go right back to them. So how old did you say your kids are? Where did you say they went to school? You know, have you got this golf course lately? I get off of the subject because I've just told them everything that I need them to know for me to be able to take my next step. See, I know what's coming. I don't have to get, I don't have to get all excited because they ask me what to do and try to tell them the whole story because I know the process. When I was selling uh, Kirby vacuum cleaners, I, didn't, I understood that there was a process. I didn't worry about what happened at each stage. When I knocked on their door for the first time, I didn't expect them to open the door and say, Kirby vacuum cleaners. All right, I've been waiting for you. Come on in. I want to buy a $2,000 vacuum from you. I knew that that wasn't going to happen. I knew that they did not want me in their home. But what I knew is I knew I had a little script that I'd probably get in their home with. And then I knew I'd go in and do a presentation. And I knew that, see, I knew that I knew what they didn't know. I knew that they didn't know what, the, I knew they didn't know what I knew. And I knew that at the end of two hours, I'd be walking out and they'd own this vacuum cleaner that they paid $2,000 for. And by the way, and I thought it was worth it. And so that, I just, I happened to know, I just knew it. I wasn't worried about it. And so when I go in there, one of the things is you get so excited because they ask you what you do and then you throw up all over them. You try to give a full BPM right then and there. What do you do? I open up offices for, fin for a financial services company. Now, what do they know by what you just told them? One, you're in a professional industry. When you go to start talking to them in the future, they're not going to say, well, I wonder if this guy's an Amway, right? Or all the things, or some multi-level marketing deal, or one of those things. The other thing they know is you are in a position of authority, a position of management. You open offices, right? Unless you're in a position of authority or something, you, you don't open offices. Now, one of the questions that might be in your mind is, well, I don't open offices. Well, yeah, you do. 
Right? When I opened my office in New York, you think I went to New York and opened my office? No, it was one of my associates knew someone who knew someone, that, right? And they were in New York. Every office I've opened up is opened up by you guys. Every office that gets opened up will be opened up by you guys recruiting people. You might not personally go over and open an office, but it's going to be because you go out there and you talk to people and you put them in front of our company. That's how our offices get opened up. You've got to make sure you feel comfortable with it in order to be able to say it with, with confidence. So I open up offices and I get off the subject. Then before, before the conversation is over, before we part ways, we go on and we build rapport and I'm small talking and we're doing that stuff and I'm trying to make a friend. Before we part ways, I simply go, I, I go, hey, by the way, do you have a business card? And they say yes or no. If they got one, great. The reason why I ask is because I mentioned to you earlier that I help open up offices for a financial services company and we're always looking for good people. I'd like, to get you, I'd like to get you some information about our company that maybe, you can, that maybe you can pass on if you happen to know someone or might even run into someone in the future that might be looking for a full part-time career change. Do you have a business card? And I get the thing. Now, there's a couple key things in this that Hubert talked about in that tape. One, he said, I never went directly after the person. He said, I always went, he's called, he said, I always went through the back door. See, if I said, I, I was wondering if you got a business card because I'm always looking for people and I thought you might be interested, what happens? Walls go up. Walls go. See, they're, they're, they are curious and they want to know, but as soon as they think you're going after them, the, wall, the natural walls go up. Natural resistance goes up. But if you say you may know someone that, I, that, that might be interested in a, in a position with our firm in the future, all of a sudden there's no walls. They go away. And so you get their business card. If they don't have a business card, then what you do is you say, well, do you have an email address? I don't ask for their number right up front. I ask if they have an email address because it's easy. Everyone gives away their email addresses. Then while you're taking down their email address, you, you, as you're writing it down, you say, and what's your number? And they'll not, they're giving you information. It's just easier to get it that way. It's just an easier way of getting it. And so now you got their number. Now what do you do? Well, first of all, where does that name and number go? On your master list, right? It goes on your prospect list. Now you're building your prospect list. You should be doing this three or four or five times a day of picking up new names. There's all kinds of other ways of doing it, but if you have to do it the other way, first, uh, this is going to be the most effective way to do it. We are a warm market relationship business. Any other way will not be as effective as this one way, according to the biggest guys in this company. According to, the guy, according to the biggest guy, probably in, in the history of either company. And so this is, how you, so this is what you've got to get good at. Now, what happens is, a couple days later, what, first of all, what do you send them? You send them uh, the web, I, 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 what I'm going to send them, first of all, I don't send it to them until I have a conversation with them. So don't, you don't just go out, I'll okay, catch up farm them, let me email them something and see if they join. That's not how you do it. But you, right, you got to follow through with what you said. So you email them worldfinancialgroup.com and agon.com. Those are the two company websites that, you wanna, that you're going to put together. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to call them up a couple days later and say, hey, John, this is Rob. I don't know if you remember me. I met you in line at the bank the other day. The reason why I'm calling is I was just about to email you that information I promised you. But the reason why I wanted to give you a call is I'm actually looking to bring some people on board with my company this month. And uh, I don't like putting ads in newspapers. I never know what I'm going to get. I prefer to work off of referrals. I was wondering if you'd do me a favor. I'd like to sit down with you for about a half hour, 45 minutes, show you a little bit about our company, what we do for families, how our compensation package works. See if you may know someone that might be uh, interested in a full or part-time position with our firm right away, or at least you'll know what I'm doing, and maybe sometime in the future you might run into someone that would be willing to help me out. Would you be willing to sit down with me for a little bit and see if you might know someone? I'm telling you, almost every single time they say yes. Why? Because they are extremely curious. What did I say yesterday? Life's already recruited them. They're already happy. They don't have a job that pays them enough money. They most likely don't have a job that they enjoy. They don't have all the time to spend that they want to spend with their family and do the things that they want to do. And so they are looking for something else. And all of a sudden, they are now in a position where they could take a look at someone and have a conversation with someone in authority with a professional company in a professional industry, and they could take a look at it without feeling pressure. Matter of fact, they're a little nervous. They're a little worried that you really aren't interested in them, that you only want to know who they might know. They actually, they're hoping that, that when they get together that they might somehow get you to stop talking about who they know and maybe take a look at them. That, that's what goes through their mind. And so you go through that script and it's, it's just an appointment almost every single time. 
So here's the process. This is very simple. We don't need to spend an hour on it. You go out, you build rapport, and you get your message out. Build rapport and get a simple message out. Get a contact. That's all it's designed for. I open up offices for a financial services company. Hey, before you go, you got a business card. Uh, the reason why I ask is I'd like to send you some information on our company so maybe you can pass it on to someone. I'm, uh, we're always looking for good, good people, part-time or full-time. A couple days, and that's it. You grab a name and number, you're done. A couple days later, you call them back, you use that script, and you'll get appointments. There is, if you, think about this. If you're full-time, if you're not on appointments, or if you don't have lists in front of you that you're making phone calls, you should be out doing this. That's your, that's, those are your three activities. You're on an appointment. I don't care if it's hiring review, fast starts, uh, uh, right, client appointments. You're making calls to set up appointments with on your own list and on your teammates list, and you're out doing this. That's it. If you put, do you understand if you put eight hours a day doing those three things, you'd probably be a CEO in six months. If you really put, if you really put in the time that it took that, that a real job required of you. Think about this, think about this for a second, guys. How, much, how many hours does your job that pays you $30,000, $50,000 a year require of you? 40, 50, 60 hours a, uh, a week, right? And we think that if we show up to a meeting once a week or twice a week, we're gonna somehow get wealthy. You gotta put, you gotta put some time into this thing. It's scary, if, you, if we really analyze how much time you really worked, if you were to go out and just put 10 hours a week in, of real work, I mean really doing those three activities, do you understand that would probably make you half a million dollars a year? I mean if you really did 10 hours a week, a real focused, effective work, that's what you'd get. That got Hubert Humphrey, his own company. That got him to 1,200 recruits. Now, he did, now, I mean, he, not all 1,200 was in Friendship Farming, but he did a ton of those. He went out every day, got five, 10 new names. A couple days later, he had five, 10 new people to call. He, that's how you go wide. You start off going wide by your one market, but you're gonna run out of those, and you don't got another 20 years to go develop a new war market. So you gotta learn how to do it fast, and that's how you do it. Hope it helps, talk to you guys later.